Welcome back, it's the GCN Tech Show. This week, we talk about the world's lightest bike, flared handlebars, and two spoke wheels. Plus, we've got the best cycling innovation. And we enter another product into the wall of fame. What's hot in tech this week? Well, first up, there was all these people a little while back who said they didn't want disc brakes on their road bike because basically they were clutching at straws saying it made it too heavy. Well, good news for them. There's a bike shop in Arizona, in the United States, Fairwheel Bikes, who are actually working on a special project at the moment to make the world's lightest disc brake bike. That's right, it's called the Factor 02 Disc Project. Now, at first glance, as you can see, there's nothing that looks particularly lightweight about it. That might be because it's got disc brakes on it, or it might be that stealth black look. And actually, there's not really anything on it that you can't buy yourself in the shops, even though they have, of course, used super lightweight parts, a part that is from the rims. Yeah, those rims are actually prototypes. So, yep, like he says, you can't buy them, but the rest of it you can, so you're not going to add that much weight on it, even if you had to go out and buy them. The other parts, well, you've got THM clavicular cranks, which Sai and Matt used last year at the Taiwan KOM Challenge. And I remember picking them up and just being blown away at how light they were. Uh, titanium bolts too. And I mean, really, that's a nice looking bike though, isn't it? it is. Even with the disc brakes. How much does it weigh? 5.01 kilograms. Which is light, isn't it? For any bike standard, really, really let alone a disc brake bike. And they, tr they claim that they could get it down to 4.76 kilograms, which is firstly very specific indeed, uh, but to do that, they would have to use a couple of prototype parts. Yeah, I don't know if I'd like to use that or not that bike. You just want to pick it up, wouldn't you? Yeah, just show it off to people, just flag people down, other riders. Look at this, lightest bike in the world. So sticking with lightweight, ASOS have just launched this. It's the Keep RS jacket. Uh, it's designed to be used not like a normal jacket where you're going to wear it all day long, but more for the first 15 minutes of a ride or before a chilly descent, that kind of thing. So really just to keep the chill off, in fact. Yeah, it shares a lot of the features actually as the top of the range Stern Prince ASOS jacket in that it has the silicon grippers, the tape neck and wrist to reduce friction, uh, but also those slots in the rear, which mean you can access your jersey pocket through the rain jacket itself without having to pull it up, which is a neat feature, which quite literally comes in handy, doesn't it? Yeah, and it makes you wonder why no one actually thought of that, mm. you know, 10 years ago or something, because the amount of times you think, oh, I'm not gonna bother eating an energy bar, yeah. But now you can. Yeah, in a race when you didn't want to take your hands <laughs> off the bars because you were so cold to try and get the Get it up, up in there. there. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Uh, also, what's really good about it is that it's easily packable in for your, your back pockets there. So a lot of rain jackets, again, quite cumbersome. And I personally hated it, trying to put a jacket into your pocket and half it hanging out and half it not. Yeah. Also, Russell Free Fabric. Just got to put that in there. So apparently it doesn't make as much noise when you've got it on. Oh, so yeah. not irritating you on those lonesome training rides. <laughs> uh, in terms of the weight, we said it's lightweight and it comes in at 170 grams, which is a little over half the Stern Prince. So that is quite the saving. Yeah. Anyway, we'll have more tech for you later on in the show. Every week on the GCN Tech Show, we bring you some new products that have been launched or just about to be released onto the market. And well, there are loads of them out there, aren't there? Yeah, we receive a lot of press releases here at GCN Tech, it has to be said. And it does feel sometimes like people are trying to reinvent the wheel, for good or for bad. Yeah, and believe it or not, we are in fact the same age. And actually during our lifetime, we have seen the bicycle change a hell of a lot, haven't we? Yeah, I think my earliest memories of cycling tech innovation were on the mountain bike side of things, which is where I started. And I will never forget in 1994, seeing the Muddy Fox Interactive. This thing looked space age at the time. And I dare say it would still look quite space age now, but the idea behind it was that it was full suspension. And when your front wheel hit a bump, it would then send a signal to your rear wheel, which was then prepared to dampen the suspension. Wow. Uh, it was a great idea. <laughs> Obviously it didn't work, otherwise it would be here today. But at yeah. the time, I really wanted one. I, I, to be honest, I genuinely missed that. I never even saw it. Uh, that's how long it lasted. But however, I'd love if someone has got one, so let us know because that's definitely one for our GMBN yeah. colleagues to have a go on. But back in that era, so the late 80s, early 90s, there was one individual who stood out for me, Dan, and that was Greg LeMond, the American. I mean, he came back from a near-death hunting accident, believe it or not, and then won the Tour de France and Worlds off the back of that. But 
despite all of that, he was the guy really who changed it for me. Aero helmet, tri bars, big Oakleys, the American smile. Wow, what yeah. a guy. John's getting quite emotional as you can see. Uh, just to point out, he has been had restraining orders from various bike shops around the world, the latest of which was just two weeks ago, wasn't it? Dan, I thought Doesn't you like were Seriously, shop. mate. Yeah, but in terms of innovation, I'm afraid I'm going back to my mountain bike days again because another one I distinctly remember is where we went, went from thummies, shifters on the top oh, yeah. of the bars, to Shimano's STI levers, which uniquely were underneath the bars, yeah. which remains to this day. And also, we had grip shift, didn't we, as well, which ironically yeah. wasn't particularly grippy, particularly when it was wet and muddy, couldn't really change gear. <laughs> yeah, I remember as well uh, seeing them on road bikes as well. So you had a very short last, uh, basically life on road bikes, and they were right at the end of the handlebars. So similar to the old school cyclocross bikes, mm. raced a crit once with a guy and he spent the whole race holding onto them, trying to change gear. <laughs> Poor lad, he was spinning off. Uh, but then also around that time as well was Graham Obrey and Chris Boardman. I mean, that was a true battle both in terms of ability as well as the bikes that they were using, wasn't it? Yeah, there were a few very key people in that era, weren't there? Had a massive impact on the cycling tech. And I always think that you know when you're getting somewhere with bike innovation, when the UCI decides to step in with new rules so that you can no longer use it. But who knows where we'd be now <laughs> yeah. if it wasn't for a few key individuals back then. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, back in the mid 90s into 2000s, aluminium frames, they became popular again. So they used to be popular once upon a time, but they were so flexible, riders in the end went back to a heavier steel bike. Also deep section aluminium wheels. You can't imagine using those big deep rims like that anymore. No. Not in aluminium anyway. Not in aluminium, no, but like you say, carbon fiber has been the big thing over mm. the last, what, 25 years? I mean, it was yeah. introduced with bourbon, etc., in the 90s, but it wasn't really until the 2000s that it really started to become mainstream as manufacturers learn how to use this new material, make it strong in the right direction and also make it lightweight. And that, I think, has changed things hugely for us as road riders, hasn't it? Because pretty much every component on the bike now can be made from carbon fiber from the frame set to the forks to the handlebars to the stem to the seat post to the saddle rails to the wheels it's changed dramatically in the last yeah. 25 years and it's relatively affordable as well isn't it really yeah you know the price of it has relatively. certainly dropped you anyway. still get expensive stuff obviously yeah. but relatively cheap uh, anyway we could go on and on and on about cycling innovation as you can probably tell but what we really want to know is what has stood out for you mm. over the last 30 or 40 years since you've been riding either in terms of stuff that you've seen or indeed stuff that you've used yeah maybe it's the muddy fox interactive like Dan. Uh, if it is actually let us know we want to see that uh, but yes make sure you let us know your key changing bike part in the comments down below and why as well yeah catch your title there key changing bike parts let us know <laughs> so last week Sai and i we spoke about special bikes that riders are using in the spring classics yes and in contrast to the opening weekend i on had newsblad and kuna brussels kuna there were a few riders using disc brakes at strada bianca including the trek sega fredo squad and on the women's side we had the canyon sram team and also bulls dormans However, I thought it was interesting to note that none of the top three riders in the men's race were on disc brakes. Even world cyclocross champion Wout Van Aert was mm. on rim brakes. And you'd have thought that of any race in the men's professional calendar that would warrant the use of disc brakes, it would be the one that's on gravel, Sala Bianca. So yeah. that's an interesting choice, isn't it? Yeah, and I thought, to be honest with you, that Wout, he would be the guy who would use them, but obviously not. Uh, interesting as well, is that most of the riders were on either 25, 26, or 28 millimeter tires out there. And also, I got the magnifying glass on the images and I saw some gum wall continental tires. Yeah, I noticed them. They look really nice, don't I they? I love a gum wall tire. Yeah. There's something about it. It's always interesting how few changes pro riders make to their standard bikes for almost all races, barring perhaps. Harry Roubaix, they pretty much stick to the standard ones. All right, we do love to read your comments about tech underneath the show each week, and we picked out four of our favorites from last week's show. First up, Nicholas Erickson. He takes his fo Focus is Alco with Reynolds Attacks wrapped in 25mm Conti GP4000s on dirt frequently with no problems. Cli climbing is incredible, and whilst descending is a little bit slower, it's perfect for classics in his opinion. Mm. Uh, Chris Capoccia has said, why not go one by 
at Roubaix. Uh, this is going to light up the comments. Yeah, it's an oh, interesting no. one, isn't it? The pros do often change the chain rings at Roubaix, maybe a 42 by 53 or 54 perhaps if it's a tailwind, uh, because there aren't those huge climbs. But there are some rises, particularly at the start of that race, where they need a slightly smaller gear. And I think they like the closeness of ratio of the rear mm. cassette for that race in particular, because sometimes you want a very subtle change of cadence when you're going over the cobbles and you've lost a bit of speed, and perhaps they still feel like the jump between the gears on a one by is a bit too big. Mm. Also, a mistimed gear change, something like that, you could end up going from you know pedaling in your ideal cadence to suddenly spinning out. Mm. That's you are not right. What though. you want on cobbles? Once the hammer goes down, they're pretty much just on the big ring the whole way. So get stuck in. Uh, Aaron B, uh, he wants to know why pros don't go tubeless with a wider tyre on the Classic. Well, I think the real answer for that is there's not the options out there available just yet, is there, for no, tubeless tyres? that too would make sense, and I wouldn't be yeah. at all surprised to see more of that in the not too distant future. Uh, and finally, Mateus Optebic. Uh, super sicked for the Spring Classics. Uh, he <laughs> reckons that he saw in the Belgian papers that um, What's his name? Greg Van Avermaet. That's the one. G I've got GVA on here and his name's completely escaped my mind. Greg Van Avermaet was seen using 28mm tyres at Het Newsblad. And that is reasonably new because yeah. they don't generally go above about 25 or 26 for anything but Roubaix. What did you use when you did those races? Uh, yeah, 25s I think for Flanders and then the team were using 28s for Paris-Roubaix. Right, there we are. We are going to do a tyre width test in the not too distant future though. Uh, so we shall get back to you with the results on that. Stay tuned. Yeah. Right then, what else is new in the world of tech this week? Well, last week Cy and I spoke about the new Checkpoint gravel bike. So let's continue that theme and talk about a couple more gravel parts out there. Yeah, we've got some new handlebars for starters. Eastern have released uh, some handlebars aimed specifically at gravel forward slash adventure riders, denoted by the AX prefix. Now, of course, on the road, things are gradually getting narrower, particularly for pros. Mm. Out in Abu Dhabi, I saw a rider with 37 centimeter handlebars. I think that was edge to edge on the hoods as well. That's but understandably, narrow. things on gravel and more off-road are going in the opposite direction. So these new offerings from Eastern come in up to 46 centimetres width. Uh, but there's quite the flare on them as well, 16 degrees. Uh, so they're even That's wider wide, down on the it? drops. Yeah. Now the thinking process behind the flare is for increased comfort down there on the drops, as well as better stability and handling when you're on the gnarly stuff, I believe they call it, those adventure riders. Prices start at 50 US dollars. Uh. That's quite a bargain. Uh, also getting in on the act are 3T with the gravel handlebars. Theirs, we think, are called the Super Gaias. Yeah. Not entirely <laughs> sure on the pronunciation, so apologies if we got that wrong. Uh, they are also flared, but the amount of flare depends on the width of the handlebar. So if you've got 40 centimetre handlebars, there's an eight degree flare. Whereas if you've got 44 centimetres, that goes up to 11 and a half degrees. Yeah, also what feature on these I really like as well is where the handlebars go from the tops around to the brake levers. That like little corner piece there, which I spend quite a lot of time riding on, just find it comfy. They flattened it out to improve the comfort. Well, you're gonna find it even more comfy. Yeah, I just maybe go to sleep now when I ride, who knows? <laughs> However, neither of those handlebars actually compete with those of Doddy's uh, on his Nuka-proof digger bike. 55 centimeters wide, those handlebars. Hmm. UCI probably banned them. Yeah, they always have to take things one step too far, those mountain bikes, don't they? They've got a yeah. flare on it as well. It's yeah, 70 it does, centimetres yeah. at the bottom. <laughs> uh, right, British brand Bowman have just sent us some pictures of their brand new model, which has killed the Pilgrim's disc. Now, the brains behind the brand, Neil Webb, has decided to stick with normal standards, or at least as normal as you can possibly get out there at the moment. Yeah, it's quite a confusing world, isn't it, yeah. really? You know, even for us geeks, or me at least, uh, so he's using 140 mil discs. He's got a threaded bottom bracket on there. I can hear the cheers already. He also says that the bike can fit 30 mil tires and possibly even wider. So that's good if you want to hit the trails or do a little bit of cycle across, change the tires and mm. go out there and enjoy yourself. Looks nice too, doesn't it? Yeah, right, Another new bike recently out is the Bianchi Ultra XR3 disc. Uh, now the underlying technology with this bike is the countervail. Uh, what that does is reduce vibration by a claimed 80%, despite the Ooh. fact that it's actually stiffer than it has been before. Yeah, that's some claim, isn't it? But hey, you know, that's science, I guess. Uh, what does surprise me, though, is that they haven't introduced it to the Ultra XR4, so that's the bike that Team Lotto NL Jumbo use. Uh, 
And also, I wish they'd use a different colour. That's just personal, you know. I know there's some tradition with it, but I'd just like to see another colour from Bianchi. You are going down in the comments, Cannings. I know. Again, RIP John Cannings. <laughs> Doesn't like Celeste. Now lastly, I love a pair of cyclocross wheels. And DT Swift have just launched two new models. First up is the CRC 1100 Spline. Uh, these are designed for tubular tyres and the rim width is 26 millimetres, which is pretty wide. Uh, the reason it's so wide is actually because it better supports a 33 millimetre wide tubular tyre, which is the widest you can use in a UCI race. And why is it better supported? Well, it allows the tyre to still flex when you're riding in those off-road muddy conditions. Do you remember when we used to rattle around cyclocross races on very narrow road rims? Yeah, it was awful, wasn't it? No, we were fine, I thought. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, we were really okay. <laughs> yeah. Right, then there's the CRC 1400 spline, which is designed for clincher tyres. They have an inner rim width of 22 millimetres, and they say that the way in which the carbon is layered up on this, these rims gives extra impact protection if you need it. Thanks, mate. Uh, anyway, uh, the wheels as well, they use DT Swiss's legendary 240S hubs. And do you know what? I've got a pair of those, and they're over 20 years old and still going strong. In fact, it wasn't even called DT Swiss back then. That's how old those hubs are. Learn something new every day. And finally, I'm just going to chuck this in. Two spoke wheels. How does that work? Well, I'm not even going to begin that. Uh, however, apparently they've got the lowest air resistance on the market, even better than a disc wheel. And they're available in tubular, clincher, disc brake version, as well as a version for the track too. Do our triathletes know about this yet? Apparently, these wheels are actually quite popular in triathlon. Oh really? Do you know what, I think we should get in quick here, John, and patent the one-spoke wheel. Now you're talking. Right, more tech next week. The last week's induction of Shimano's DI2 transmission, it's time to induct another product that really did turn head seat. Yeah, all right. It's time for the clipless pedal. Now, many people out there actually thought that Look were the first company to release a clipless pedal, but they weren't. In fact, it was Cinelli in 1970. They had the M71 pedal. And luckily, it didn't catch on. Yeah, the reason it was lucky is because it used a sort of lever pin type mechanism to fasten your shoe to the pedal. So you literally had to reach down to fasten your shoe to the pedal and then reach down to release it again, which is not particularly safe, I think you'd say. No, imagine a commuter using that. <laughs> a lot less cars back then, but still terrifying. Uh, let's fast forward though, 14 years. 1984, and we find ourselves looking at the Look PP65 clipless pedal. But why was it so popular? Well, for a start, you didn't have those pins that locked you in place. Instead, you used the pressure of your foot to engage into the pedal, and then you use your heel to actually disengage. Yeah. A lot safer. You could actually already back then adjust the tension of the release using a screw. So they were well ahead of their time really when you look back. And they brought over some technology that they'd seen in the ski industry, which actually they were a part of at the time. And look, played an absolute blinder in my opinion. Back in 1983, they filed a patent that I think lasted for 30 years on that clipless pedal design. So then group set giants such as Campagnolo and Shimano had to use their, well basically had to pay a royalty yeah. to use their design. It'll be the same for us with our one spoke wheel John, won't it? Oh, yeah, now you're uh, talking. The action and the mechanism and design of look pedals though remains almost identical to this very day. And you have to say, you know you've got a decent product when it is pretty much right the first time around, don't you? Yeah. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. There we are. Remember to leave your nominations for the Hall of Fame in the comments down below. Right, it's time for Bike of the Week, where you get to vote for your favourite bike from two that we put head to head. Yes, last week the two that we had up for you were firstly the rainbow themed time trial bike of Tom Dumoulin, that being the giant Trinity, uh, and then up against it we had Greg Van Avermaet, got his name right this time, uh, his gold themed BMC team machine, and the results are in. Yeah, and can I have a drum roll please then? The winner was the BMC, 77% of the votes. Wow. Wow, it must Crushed be that, it. that you know, grey and gold paintwork. Yeah. Well, it might just be that our viewers prefer a road bike to a time trial bike. We shall never know. 
Just don't let Emma hear you saying that, <laughs> all right? All uh, right, two new bikes for you this time, both road bikes in the ring this time around. In the blue corner, we have a Factor 02, Ooh. as used by Adi Désir La Mondiale. Oh, uh, that has a full Dura Ace 9150 group set on it. It's got a physique saddle. And it also has those very visible oversized ceramic speed pulley wheels. Mm. And then in the red corner, we've got tradition. Yeah. Even though it's the brand new Colnago, the C64, as used by Team UAE Emirates, on there, there's a lot of Italian stuff. So mm. a full Campagnola EPS record group set and those Bora Ultra 50 wheels as well. Basically, it's like the heavyweight champion of the world, isn't it, when you think about Colnago in cycling. They're, they're so old, the tradition and everything, and then you've got a newcomer just coming in for a fight. Yeah. So, you know what to do. Vote up there for your favourite. Next week, we'll reveal the results and have two more head-to-head. -head. Vault time now, and since I am in the maintenance set here, I'm going to implement my own very harsh rules. Whoa, I whoa. think John <laughs> is quite trigger happy with his klaxon, which he's found, incidentally. Yeah, I got a cheap easy jet flight to Stockholm, and I recovered where Cy Richardson left it. Yeah, unfortunately. Anyway, he's only got one use of it. We've got five bikes, and I'm only going to give him one super nice. So we're going to go through them first of all. Firstly, this one from Pedro Anselmo Filo. Uh, this is very Italian, Ooh. just like the Conago 664, but this is his Villia bike with complete Campagnolo group set and Bora Ultra wheels. Indoors. Yeah, say so what, that, that's a lucky person isn't it, to be allowed to have a bike, basically what looks like inside their living room. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes take mine inside my living yeah, room. Yeah, I do it. as well. Yeah, I do like that though, but hold yeah. off on your klaxon. Next up, Ooh. from Philippe Carboneau, a Gabby, over in Canada. Uh, this is his Giant. What do you think of that? That's a nice bike, isn't it? I tell you what, the colours on that work really well for me. And importantly, look at the backdrop. That looks like a, a nice place to go riding, doesn't it? You know, one of those roads you go along and it's just got abandoned houses, there's no one else around. It, can't say no, anything more no. yet, can Hold I? Hold your horses, John. Uh, next up, we are in Holland. Wow. Uh, this is the Ridley Phoenix of Raphael Spear. Uh, quite a large bike there. It's, it's a big a old unit, guy. that, isn't it? Gold chain. What do you think Ooh. about gold chains? Personally, Sai's got one, isn't he? Personally, I'm a big fan. I also roll on a gold chain. Uh, it lets me know when to clean it. Um, I just think it's a nice little finishing touch, really. From my personal point of view, I always prefer slightly deeper wheels if you've got quite a large frame set. I think mm. it gives it more of a proportion. Yep. Uh, moving on. Vintage. Oh. I'm going retro here. Uh, this is the Klein of Steve Enrique. I do like that. I yeah. think that really stands out. Look at the glare off the top to you from the sun. I, I was a big fan of Klein mountain bikes yeah. back in the day. The paint work on them was always amazing, wasn't it? Absolutely amazing. And also, the rear dropouts on them are actually, from memory, rear facing. So you have to slot the wheel in from behind. Oh, kind of like awkward. a track wheel. Uh, and also, look at those old look pedals on there as well. Blue and yellow fade. That is a lovely looking bike. I do wonder if he's got an old school step too far uh, by mounting the head unit onto the stem. Yeah, that's true. I still think you'd get away with out front even on a retro bike. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, we have this, uh, which is a bike which wow. serves a purpose, as you yeah. can very much see. This is coming from Thomas Dorsick, uh, which is in, is that Alaska? Yeah, so that's D Denali Park Road. Interesting story here. My cousin actually ice climbed up that mountain. Blimey. Yeah, there we are. Uh, anyway, disc brake bike, obviously full of baggage. Yeah. Interestingly, we've got some corks there as the bar end plugs. Yeah, now when Thomas emailed in about this, he told me that they are in fact Belgian beer bottle corks in mm. the end of the handlebars. Wow. Mineral water. Oh, well, I'm a fan of that. Uh, incidentally, I think the last time I was in here, I got in trouble for criticising the angle of the cranks and whether or not it was in the big ring, but it's kind of all wrong there, isn't it? It's in the small ring, uh, angle of the cranks is about two o'clock, and he's using his helmet as a bike stand. Not a bike stand, it's a helmet. Protect your head. Right, so there we go, those are the five bikes. Right. Uh, John is now going to decide which one is going to be deemed super nice this week. Do you know what? They're all nice, so got that, but it's actually the giant. There's something about that giant that does it for me. Go on then, pull your trigger. Well done, yes. Philippe. Uh, make sure you yeah. keep on sending in your bikes uh, to the address which you will see on your screen right now. We'll have five more bikes for you this time next week. So that's it, nearly the time for the end of the show. But what's coming up this week? Well, on Friday, Dan asks the pros, how many bikes do they own? 
Yes, and there's a big difference between how many they own and how many they have at home. Oh. Yeah, find out on Friday. Uh, on Saturday, I take a closer look at Marcel Kittel's brand new Canyon Aero disc. On Sunday, Dan unboxes the new POC Ventral helmet. And on Monday, one of us will be back in this set, but this time for Maintenance Monday. Uh, right, before we finish, I'm gonna give a quick plug to the GCN shop because you will have noticed we are the men in black this week. Uh, we have sweatshirts and hoodies worn by yours truly and John here. Uh, they are available at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com right now, but not only that, we also have as you haven't seen on the GCN show, these brand new GCN STEM top caps. Yeah, put them on your bike, show your allegiance to us. Yeah, small but very neat indeed. Yeah. Now remember as well to like and share this video with your friends, give me a big thumbs up. Yes, and if you would like to see some more content, uh, we talked about the tendency for narrower handlebars with the pros, and I asked them all about it whilst I was in Abu Dhabi, and you can find that by clicking, I think, this way. Yeah, that way. And also, let Dan know what you think of his new bike vault scheme. Hmm. I'm sure I'll get abused. No, you won't. Go easy on him. <laughs>